I'm Chelsea Benedict and I worked in the Visible Heart Lab with Dr. Izio this summer and we looked at a solution called SMOP lipid which contains a lot of fatty acids and we looked at how it affects skeletal muscles in swine uh, when they went through a period in which they lacked oxygen to see if it had any protective effects um, during the recovery of these skeletal muscles. We found that if you add SMOP lipid before or during uh, the period in which the muscles lacked oxygen, it had a protective effect. Um, it had improved contractile function. And if you actually added smoflipid over a period of an hour um, or longer than that, it actually decreased the function. This is important because smoflipid could be a potential solution um, in patients and individuals that have to undergo surgeries in which their muscles or uh, different organs have to undergo a period in which they lack oxygen so that uh, the function of these don't decrease after the procedure has occurred. Hello, my name is Eleanor Christensen and this summer I worked in the Gary lab. The overall goal of our research was to identify genes regulated by E2V2, a master regulator of the hematopoietic and endothelial lineages. My hypothesis is that E2V2 regulates early B cell factor 1. Prior to my arrival of, at the lab, a bioinformatics study analyzed single cell RNA sequence of E2V2 EYFP expressing cells and used DPATH to organize it into a self-organizing map. This map showed that EBF1 was expressed in early progenitors of the endothelial lineage. A cluster analysis also showed that out of all the genes, EBF1 was most abundantly expressed. After this, we undertook further research. We used chip sequencing to find the ETV2 binding motif and where ETV2 binds to the EBF1 promoter. We also used ATAC sequencing to show that e there are enriched peaks in the ETV2 V2 binding sites of the EBF1 promoter. After this, we engineered embryonic stem cells that overexpress EBF1 in the presence of doxycycline, and we validated this system using a fax analysis. We engineered embryonic stem cells that overexpress EBF1 in the presence of doxycycline and validated this system with a fax analysis. We used these embryonic stem cells and made them into embroid bodies. We then exposed some to doxycycline and some to no doxycycline. We used these embroid bodies in a fax analysis of endothelial markers. This analysis showed that EBF1 promotes the endothelial lineage. From all of this research, we know that EBF1 is expressed in the endothelial lineage, ETV2 binds to the EBF1 promoter, and EBF1 promotes the expression of the endothelial lineage. Hi, I'm Megana Iyer, and I worked in the lab of Dr. Robert Tranquillo. The goal of my project was to design a novel replacement vein valve for the legs to treat chronic venous insufficiency, or CVI, and its associated conditions such as varicose veins. This project is important because CVI affects over 6 million adults in the U.S. alone and costs the government over $1 billion annually in treatment costs. In my project, I propose to design a novel prosthetic vein valve that incorporates a new feature called the sinus pocket. I hypothesize that incorporating the sinus pocket would facilitate vein valve closure and optimize its overall performance. To test this hypothesis, I first proposed a sinus design concept based on literature. I then 3D printed this design and assembled it and assessed this design using an in vitro hemodynamic tester system called a pulse duplicator system, which essentially mimics the in vivo environment that vein valves undergo. After testing this design, I found that the sinus design consistently helped in lowering the closing time of the vein valve, and it also minimized the backflow of fluid needed to close the valve. I also changed the systemic pressure across the system to mimic positions of standing, sitting, and lying down, 
And overall, for the lying down position, I found that the sinus design helped in lowering the systolic pressure drop across the valve. In conclusion, the impact of the study is significant because it yields significant insight into a new design that could possibly affect and enhance bioprosthetic vein valve performance for patients with moderate to severe CVI. Thank you. Hi, my name is Daniel Johnson, and I worked in Dr. Van Berlo's lab this summer. During a heart attack, the muscle cells of the heart, called cardiomyocytes, are damaged, and the adult human heart has a limited ability to regenerate these types of cells. Regenerating cardiomyocytes could restore the normal contractile function of the heart, and gene editing technologies like CRISPR-Cas9 may make this possible. Basically, CRISPR-Cas9 uses a guide RNA sequence to cut a specific gene in the DNA of a living organism. In our study, we focused on 10 genes shown to inhibit cardiomyocyte proliferation and attempted to knock them out in mouse heart cells using CRISPR-Cas9. We hypothesized that this would stimulate cardiomyocyte proliferation. We designed guide RNAs specific to each gene and inserted them into DNA containing the sequence for Cas9. Then we introduced that DNA into mouse heart cells where Cas9 cut the genes of interest. Right now, we're optimizing this procedure for all 10 genes, and in the future, we're going to test this on live adult mice. If it stimulates cardiomyocyte proliferation, then we hope to one day use this technology to repair the hearts of human patients. Hi, everyone. I'm Bailey Kemp, and this summer, I worked in Dr. Don Lau's lab researching Duchenne muscular dystrophy, or DMD. Our goal was to study the role of tetrahydrobiopterin, or BH4, on disease pathology using an MDX mouse model of DMD. BH4 plays a role in the production of nitric oxide as well as in neurotransmitter synthesis, and BH4 is found to be significantly lower in MDX mice than in wild-type mice. So that said, we hypothesized that lower levels of BH4 may play a role in disease progression, especially concerning cognitive deficits and muscle degeneration. The first question we asked was why is BH4 lower in MDX mice? To answer this, we use Western blotting to quantify the levels of the enzymes responsible for the production of BH4. We found that one of these enzymes, sepia reductase, is significantly lower in MDX brain and skeletal muscle tissue when compared to wild-type tissue. So lower levels of this enzyme may be the reason that BH4 is lower as well. We also wanted to know if supplementing BH4 could impact disease progression. So for the last several weeks, we have been feeding MDX mice a supplemental BH4 diet and using HPLC to quantify the levels of BH4 in urine collected from the mouse each week. This is an ongoing study, so in the following few weeks, we will be performing several assays to assess cognitive function and muscle pathology in these mice. This research is important because DMD is a fatal neuromuscular disease with no cure, and novel treatment strategies are necessary to both lengthen the life and improve the quality of life in patients with DMD. Hi, my name is Grace Colleen and I'm from Dr. Perlingero's lab. This summer, we study limb girdle muscular dystrophy type 2A, an autosomally recessive muscular dystrophy caused by a mutation on the gene that codes for the protein calpane 3. In order to further understand the function of calpane 3 as well as have a negative control in future gene correction strategies, we created a calpane 3 knockout human IPS cell line. The creation of this knockout cell line was done through the use of CRISPR-Cas9, a genome editing tool that uses the Cas9 enzyme to create a double strand break at a desired location. Once we created this double strand breaks and deleted our calpane 3 gene in our human IPS cells, we were able to differentiate these cells into multinucleated myotubes. These myotubes showed a lack of calpane 3 expression both on an RNA level with an RT-PCR as well as a protein level with a western blot. Both our RT-PCR and our western blot indicated that our calpane 3 knockout was successful and that there was a lack of calpane 3 protein expression. Hello, my name is Chris Leland and I'm a student in the Kaiba Lab where we study the role that DUX4 has in causing fascioscapural humeral muscular dystrophy. FSHD is a variable muscle disease that affects certain muscle groups but doesn't present with extra muscular complications like heart disease. 
We hypothesize that cardiomyocytes are protect, protected from Dux4 expression and FSH, FSHD manifestation through some unknown mechanism, which could possibly be exploited in the future for potential therapies or cures. We evaluated this by differentiating induced pluripotent stem cells into cardiomyocytes and assessing them for cardiac protein markers and spontaneous cell beating. Ultimately, our results were variable, but the general trend showed better differentiation in non-FSHD cell lines. We concluded that optimal cell conditions must be determined before differentiating into cardiomyocytes and that FSHD differentiation is extremely variable between cell lines. This work will advance science by laying a foundation for understanding the disease mechanism behind FSHD and why it selectively affects certain muscle groups but not other vital areas of the body. Hi, I'm Weston Lowry, and this summer I worked in the Metzger lab. My project involved identifying and characterizing small molecules with the potential to correct cardiomyopathy, which is a kind of inherited heart disease. Some kinds of cardiomyopathy are caused by an increased calcium sensitivity in a protein called troponin C, which, when bound to by calcium, causes contractions to occur. The aim of this project was to find a molecule that could reduce the excessive calcium sensitivity, returning cells to the normal operating range and preventing negative symptoms from occurring. The ideal molecule would reduce calcium sensitivity, thereby reducing cellular contractility, and would do so without changing the calcium concentrations of the individual cells. The first molecule that I tested, TCI-208, did cause a significant decrease in cellular contractility without reducing the calcium concentrations of the individual cells. The second molecule that I tested, TCI-401, also caused a significant reduction in cellular contractility, but also reduced the calcium concentrations in the individual cells which is an indication of adverse side effects. This means that TCI-401 is not a candidate for further study as far as this project goes. TCI-208, however, had all the potentially therapeutic characteristics that we were looking for and should be further studied, possibly on the whole organ level or in a, in a disease model. Hi, my name is Anjola Onodipe. Uh, I'm going into my senior year at Minnesota State University in Mankato, and I've worked in the Dudley lab this summer um, uh, looking at uh, diastolic dysfunction and if magnesium supplementation can reverse the effects of diastolic dysfunction. Uh, diastolic dysfunction is when the uh, heart muscle has uh, trouble relaxing properly, so then less blood fills in, and that leads to a bunch of other issues. and. We know that other disease states such as um, diabetes can lead to diastolic dysfunction. And so in this project, we looked at if magnesium supplementation in diabetic mice were able to reverse the effects of diastolic dysfunction. And um, when we um, did our experiments, we found that the magnesium supplement supplementation um, improved markers for diabetes. So um, the mice had uh, lower um, blood glucose and did better on the glucose tolerance test. And then when we tested for diastolic dysfunction, the magnesium was able to reverse the uh, frequency of diastolic dysfunction. And we also looked at um, the function of the mitochondria. Um, since the mitochondrial function is compromised in diastolic dysfunction and the magnesium also uh, seemed to improve the mitochondrial structure and function. So. Um, overall, um, in the study, we were able to show that uh, magnesium treatment um, may be able to reverse the effects of diastolic dysfunction. Hello, my name is Eric Ski. I worked over the summer in the Dan Gary Laboratory with Satya Das investigating ETB2 interacting partners and the mechanism by which ETB2 regulates endothelial gene transcription. We'd hypothesized that ETB2 may transactivate endothelial genes through interaction with specific endothelial transcription factors. We had performed yeast 2 hybrid analysis using ETB2 as bait and identified VESF1 as a potential co-binding partner. So we further characterized the interaction of ETB2 and VESF1 through co-immunoprecipitation, co western blot, and GST pull-down analysis. We found ETB2 and VESF1 function as direct binding partners. This is a novel finding and it supports our hypothesis that ETB2 can directly interact with specific endothelial transcription factors. We also performed bioinformatic analysis of single cell RNA sequencing data and investigated genes which contain ETB2 and VESF adjacent binding motifs, which are also co-expressed with ETB2 and VESF1 in developing embryos. We identified HDAC7 
and a modal 2 as candidates for further study. A modal 2 is a moten family protein, which plays a role in angiogenesis and endothelial cell polarity and migration. HTAC7 is a class 2 deacetylase, which is specifically expressed within endothelium. We interrogated the transcript levels of HTAC7 and a modal 2 in response to ETB2 and VESF1 overexpression and their respective knockout lines in the ESCV system. We found that overexpression of our transcription factors increase expression for both genes. We also found that knockout of both transcription factors reduce expression for our genes, suggesting both ETB2 and VESF function as transactivators for these endothelial genes. We also interrogated the promoter regions of both of these genes through chromatin immunoprecipitation with ETB2 and VESF pulldowns. We found that both ETB2 and VESF1 both strongly bind to the promoter regions of HTAC7 and modal 2 within 50 base pairs of one another, showing uh, that ETB2 and VESF1 can bind to these promoters and bind within proximity to be a direct complex interaction. We also wanted to investigate the biological significance of ETB2 VESF coactivation of HDAC7. So we performed a histone acetyltransferase assay, which quantitatively, uh, which quantifies the relative levels of histone uh, acetylation in the ESEV system. We found that overexpression of VESF1 increases total deacetylated histone levels, and the knockout of VESF1 decreases these levels. So we've shown here today that ETB2 and VESF are direct interacting partners, that they can bind to the promoter regions of endothelial genes and transactivate expression. We've shown that transactivation of HDAC7 through ETB2 VESF1 plays a significant role in the chromatin acetylation in the ESCV system. Thank you. My name is Marina Smolage, and this summer I worked in the Visible Heart Lab with Dr. Paul Izio. My research focused on tricuspid valve regurgitation, which is commonly treated using tricuspid valve annulopathy to reinforce and reduce the size of the tricuspid valve annulus. Interventional cardiologists are looking to transition to a transcatheter approach for this procedure, but this poses a greater risk of impinging or damaging the right coronary artery. To address this issue, we chose to quantify the proximity of the right coronary artery to the tricuspid valve annulus. We used MR and CT images to reconstruct 3D models of human heart specimens, and we developed a MATLAB script to calculate the average minimum distance between the right coronary artery and the tricuspid valve annulus. After modeling 30 human hearts, we found that the average minimum distance was 6.7 millimeters. Our growing anatomical database will provide surgeons with a detailed 3D anatomical map of the area surrounding the tricuspid valve to help improve procedural planning and success rates. We also hope that this will allow annuloplasty device designers to create more refined guidelines for annuloplasty rings and fastening systems. Hello everyone, my name is Mitchell Taylor, and this summer I worked in Dr. Duane Tunson's lab to study Duchenne muscular dystrophy, or DMD. My specific project involves studying the susceptibility to cardiac injury in hearts with mosaic dystrophin expression. And ultimately this project is of, is of importance because while mosaic expression has been shown to be protective in skeletal muscle, it is highly debated whether or not this protection can be extended to cardiac muscle. To test this, we produced two strains of MDX-C10 carrier mice that expressed a mosaic dystrophin expression. And with these mice, we put them through a series of challenges that involved injections with 10 mg per kilogram of isoproterenol to induce the dystrophic phenotype. Following the injections, we harvested the hearts of these mice and evaluated for relative levels of both acute damage and replacement fibrosis. To measure acute damage, we stained for endogenous mouse IgG as well as dystrophin. And to evaluate replacement fibrosis, we stained using a serious red fast green dye. Overall, the trend we observed was an increased level in both acute injury and replacement fibrosis, suggesting that a mosaic dystrophin expression in the heart is inadequate to protect against cardiac injury. Ultimately, these results are important because both mothers and sisters of fully dystrophic males should be closely monitored in the clinic for symptoms of cardiomyopathy, as well as proposed therapies that involve restoring dystrophin in a mosaic pattern should be further evaluated. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Maxwell Wang, and I've been working in the Dr. Michael Kaiba lab. 
Our goal this summer was to use gene editing technology as a means to cure FSHD. Facial scapulo humeral muscular dystrophy is one of the most common forms of muscular dystrophy, and its effects on skeletal muscle degeneration is debilitating both physically and mentally for the patient. And as such, it's important that we find a cure for it. Now, FSHD is caused by an unregulated expression of Dux4 protein, something that isn't found in patients without FSHD. And it is our thoughts that by changing and deleting the gene sequences that are responsible for making this protein, that we can cure FSHD. In order to do this, we use CRISPR-Cas9, as well as zinc finger telomere insertion, in order to cut these gene sequences out. Our results indicate that after doing this recombination and correction, that the proteins that are often regulated by Dux4 protein are significantly reduced, meaning that we had successfully stopped production of Dux4 protein. We conclude that curing FSHD at a cell level is very potentially possible. However, there is a lot of work that needs to be done in order to translate this to the human level. And it is our hopes that using the corrected cell line that we've created, as well as using the information that we've gathered on Dux4 expression, that we can cure FSHD in the foreseeable future.